Hello, everyone. Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> nice. The last speakers, it didn't seem so loud, so I was like, I'm going to yell. Okay, I won't yell. <laughs> so my name is Guy Carmelli. I'm just going to do a quick introduction for me, and then I'll let our panelists introduce themselves, and then we'll get into this. Um, we've given a form of this kind of content in different formats, whether it be didactics, workshops, and stuff. We recently figured, you know, a lot of people had a bunch of questions at the end of our sessions, and we're like, why don't we just start with the question aspect, and we made it into a panel. So hopefully we can deliver a lot of this great content in a way that is more uh, suited to your guys' <laughs> questions and needs. So as a panel, it's, we're going to have some questions that I might start with, but you guys are welcome to come stand up here and, and go to the microphone and ask whatever questions you have. A little bit about me. Um, I grew up in California, and then I did residency in New York. I did a med ed fellowship and a master's in um, medical education. And I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of different speaking engagements at different conferences. And so I'm really passionate about like how to give good presentations and didactics. I will then come over here to Sri. Hey guys, we're going to be sharing one microphone, so you'll hear. We'll try to keep it smooth. But I'm Sri Nadation. I'm one of the APDs at Duke. I'm trained at WashU, but I um, have spoken with all of my wonderful colleagues and friends on on this topic, and I've learned a lot from them as well. So some of the stuff I'll be sharing is uh, things I've stolen from them. So excited to be part of the panel. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Mike Gottlieb. I'm the Olson Division Director, the Program Director at Ru Olson Program Director at uh, Rush in Chicago. Why I'm really excited to talk with y'all is to basically share my lessons learned because I, f I feel like a lot of my talks very on were falling kind of forward fast the hard way, and I did a lot of talks where I look back and I'm like, wow, how did I, how did anyone let me up on stage? That's someone needed to do like a mini you know intervention, be like, no, 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 change that, change that, do this differently. And as I've done more and more talks. I reflect back and I try to figure out what things I could, be, I could have done better and hope that you can all kind of learn from some of the stuff I've done as I've gone through my own kind of personal journey of doing talks. Good afternoon. I'm Kelly Reshinowski. I am one of the APDs at Stanford. I am simulation trained by background, so I did a sim fellowship and master's in healthcare simulation. And currently I'm running the didactic curricular component for our residency. So really excited to be here and chat with you guys today. And, and last and least, uh, yeah, my name no. is uh, Anahita Kalantari. I am the uh, Vice Chair of Education at Penn State Health. And uh, I am here because I coached some of these guys on uh, how to do their didactics. And uh, they asked me to join the panel, and I'm thrilled to be here. All right, so we got some great minds here. One of the best educators, uh, lecturers. So please, this is more entertaining and interesting if you guys have questions specific questions, but I'm just going to start off with a low ball general question. What makes a bad lecture presentation or slide deck? I'll let AK start us off. So I think one of the things that's the most important in any kind of didactic you're preparing is understanding the importance of story. We really are telling stories in our didactics, and we as human beings have been drawn to stories for centuries. So when you give any kind of presentation, with or without media, I mean, it doesn't even have to have media, I think the very first thing you need to do is kind of align your story, do your research on your topic, um, and, and frame it in such a way that you can have a group follow you through the entire story from beginning to end. And then you can use the media to enhance your story. But it really comes down to the work that you put into the, the design of the entire didactic and not just, oh, I'm going to give a talk on like chest pain, whip out your computer and start typing in some things for chest pain. You need that story development. It's very easy to just copy and paste an up-to-date article into slides. And there's no rhyme or reason to how you're going. But like actually working and saying, this is, this, this is the learning objectives. And this is how I'm going to tell it and prepare you for the learning objectives. And then tell you the learning objectives. And then finish it off by like summing it all up and why this is important to you in a story format is what makes good lectures from just people who are reading off up to date for you. 
Absolutely, and then another thing that I always like to think about when I do finally get to that point of developing what media and what um, content I want to be visually shown is bringing a, a theory that we use in simulation of signal and noise, right? Your signal is your learning objectives. This is what you want your learners to actually walk away and take home. And then really thinking about slide design as, as how much noise can you bring in to either connect and, and make that signal stronger or is distracting. So too many slides, um, going faster than you know, one slide per minute, having too many things crowding the actual visual space, all of that noise can actually pull away attention from the real learning objectives you're trying to instill in your learners. And at the root of it, uh, kind of aligning with what uh, AK had mentioned. It's a talk, ultimately, right? It's called a talk. It's not called a picture. It's not called a slide. It's a talk, and it's all about you talking. That's the root of everything. That's why the slides don't really matter. If they add to your talk, great. Maybe they add context. Maybe they humanize it. But having words up there, if I have an option between reading and listening, and this is born out in the literature, is you choose to read. We all choose to read. Watch a movie with subtitles. You'll start reading the subtitles. If the character's voice changes, they change their words, you'll still follow the subtitles. We know this. If I want to read subtitles, I'm going to read a book. It's a talk. You want to hear the person. So step away from the slides. The slides could theoretically not even be there, and they should only be there to add volume to what you're already going to say. And I'll, I'll just echo my, co my colleagues, you know, really, I think, you know, the reason why TED Talks are so popular, it's not about the slide, right? All the slides are so minimal because it's to draw the attention back to that speaker to tell their story. So very much as you're thinking and listening to us, you have a story to tell and you should be passionate about it. And once you know your story and you're passionate about it, that will translate to the audience. And that is really what will give you invitations to speak, invitations to come back to speak, and also help change the world, right? Because you have that story that you really want to share with the world. And I know we have it ingrained in us that our students need those slides to study. It's their primary form of studying for the test, right? They print out those text-heavy slides to use, but I would argue that it's a horrible way to study for test A. But B, if you are married to the idea that you, the content deliverer, have to provide written content to your learners, there's other ways of doing that. What a lot of us do is create a handout based on our lecture with all that content. And you can say, I don't need anyone. All you can write down everything I say. Everything I say is in the handout. I want you to focus and engage and like really be in the moment with what I'm saying. So I'm going to lead into our next question. And it kind of has to do with what Mike was kind of mentioning a bit about how we take in information. And I, I put this down as something that I'm going to talk about. But the question was, that I have written down is discussing Richard Mayer's cognitive theory for multimedia learning. So he hypothesized that there's different channels that we use to acquire information. The pictorial, um, where we see words and pictures and stuff, and then the auditory, where we actually hear sounds. And they're completely different channels, and we can't engage in both channels at the same time. So as Mike was saying, if, if you put up a slide full of text and you're talking at the same time, you can actually read and acquire information in that channel much quicker than you can listening. You can reread, you have kind of control of it in your own way, but when I'm speaking, if you like miss a word, you're already behind, so it's much easier to just focus on one channel at a time, and then you're not really getting the full benefits of a lecture presentation, which is supposed to be a supplementation of both visual and um, auditory. And so, AK was telling me earlier about, you know, Alan pa Paolo, you, Alan, why don't you tell more Alan about Alan Pavia's dual channel theory. I mean, it's a learning theory on how we process information. You know, when a, a child learns of what a dog is, they see the image of the dog and they hear the word dog, and that's how they learn dog. It's not about having D-O-G written above where they stare at that and they hear someone else say dog. Um, so it, when you have um, words and you're trying to listen to somebody, it creates cognitive dissonance. And so there is decrease in learning. And so if you think about any kind of didactic, however we're trying to do it, whether it's 
you know, a flipped classroom and you're debriefing, whether it's a lecture, no matter what it is, the ultimate goal is for people to learn. And so when you have all of those words up there while you're speaking, you're actually working against your cause of trying to initiate long-term learning of these materials that you felt were important enough to take time out of your conference to deliver. But that is to say that there's no good slides, there's no good visual, and only the auditory is important because in this theory, they say that if you are learning something using both channels, both audio and visual at the same time, you can have more long-term retention of that information. So the question is, how do you provide both channels without them overloading, you know, cognitive overload and fighting for each other? And it's about how you introduce the text, whether it's, you know, bits of information at a time in small bullets or photos that add something like an emotional picture that gives you, you, you can sit there and be like 55 year old female with you know, Hispanic female with this past medical history and all this stuff, or you could just put up a picture of a person which will have much more impact and then you can kind of just talk about what she comes in for. So we all kind of know like, okay, we should have a little less text and more good quality images. But maybe Kelly, do you want to kind of talk about how you find good images and how you insert them into the slides? One thing that AK was just wondering, as we just kind of reviewed Meyer's theory, did anyone have any questions that they wanted us to expand a little bit more before we moved on? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, like to check in. So, you know, there, and this is one of those moments where you can go onto your app um, and click our handout because we do have a nice listing of various forms um, and modalities that you can use to select images. You know, it's, I've been to lectures where the only thing that's shown are, are photos or pictures on a slide deck. And I think there's certain aspects where that is really effective. I do like to really mix and, and better highlight. Um, so for example, you know, I think one of the questions that we were discussing was bullet points. What is the utility of bullet points in a PowerPoint or in a slide deck? And my question would always be, what is your intent? You know, we see bullet points in our textbooks all the time, and this is what we study, where we make flashcards from it, a listing of signs and symptoms for some disease process. I challenge you instead, are you, are you trying to get your learners to look at your slide or look at your lecture as a textbook, or are you trying to really build a mental model for them that they can develop an image in their head? So instead, can you just put an image of a body and graphics to represent those signs and symptoms so that they can really hone that in in their mind as more than just what these the visual of the words written out are. And then, you know, definitely be mindful as, you know, where you're giving that presentation. So a lot of copyright um, pictures you have to be really careful about, just like going, jumping on Google and saying, I need a, for example, I was looking for a picture of a graduation hat with a stethoscope. There are no free images if you're looking for that. It does not exist. But, but so you have to be thoughtful about like copyright and when you're going to use it. For example, if you're speaking at a national conference, do not use copyright. Any any paid you know performance that you're giving or speak, speaking opportunities, you cannot because they're charging people for that content. So that technically that picture should copyright picture should be paid for as well too. So there are a lot of uh, free opportunities out there. So Unsplash is one, Pixabay is another one, Pexel is another um, option. And we have this in our handout, so don't worry about like quickly writing the notes in the app itself. We actually have a list of about six or seven in the handout itself, but being thoughtful about you know what picture you're looking for and then looking at some of these free resources are really helpful. Otherwise, if you do look at Google, make sure that it's, you know, say that it's free license to use that as well, because you can otherwise get yourself in trouble with that. And I will say that I've reached a phase in my life where I will trade uh, my time for money. And so uh, I don't want to sit down and spend hours upon hours uh, looking through Pixabay to try and find the right image. So I cross the dark side and I just pay a monthly subscription to uh, have access for different images. Um, so you can do that with Adobe or Shutterstock, and, and there's other ones that are available as well. I just think if you if you get to that point in your career where you are giving a lot of talks and you do need a lot of image access, mm -hmm. to me it's just worth it because spending all that time finding pictures, it, it could take you days. Mm 
Yeah, one of the worst experiences is you have an image in your head of like what you want, and you see it, but it costs, and you're trying to find it for free. Um, so let's get into the next thing. It, so it sounds like images are great, right? We should just have all images. Well, are all images created equal? What are your guys' thoughts about, you know, cartoon images, kid, pictures of infants and puppies, and GIFs that just cycle over and over? I think it depends on what your goal is. Mm -hmm. And, and that kind of, if you're having a really serious talk about, um, you know, a, a, somebody died, or you wanna have, you wanna reach your uh, learners emotionally, you know, having a picture of Homer Simpson is not gonna be helpful. And so, but maybe you do wanna do something lighthearted. Maybe it's to talk about communication and you wanna use an example of like a terrible communicator, then a picture of Homer Simpson would be absolutely appropriate. Uh, in general, for high stakes, to any kind of high stakes teaching that I'm doing, I kind of avoid uh, cartoons unless I am trying to go for something lighthearted and, and more of kind of a comical approach. I don't know. I, I agree on that front, and really just make sure it makes sense. Because we talk, you know, Guy was talking earlier about cognitive load theory and the context of it, and if you have an image that really doesn't connect with what you're trying to say, people are gonna spend a lot of their brain capacity trying to figure out why that's up there. And we're like, well, why did they post that? I wonder what that is, and then you're not listening to anything else. So I think it's one thing to be conscious of. The other one is just be conscious of representation, right? So when we're looking at the images, we should step back from a DI perspective and say, are, are we being thoughtful about who are in these images? Are they appropriately diverse? Um, is it all a white male doctor every time? Like, that's not right. We need to be thoughtful of that when we're doing our slides. And I think that's incumbent upon us that even if the pictures out there are not appropriately attributed, that we have the ability ourselves to fix that. And definitely, if you don't pay attention to that, we kind of get into the same mindset that, you know, these pictures are all created equal. But if you type in, for example, like teamwork, and you look at pictures of people with their hands over each other, uh, typically it is a white male's hand always on top, right? And it just made me pause to think of, oh, I'm looking for a different type of picture, right? A female hand or something different. So uh, diversity for our learners can help them connect, right? If they are able to see someone who looks like them, they'll connect a little bit more with the information that's given. So we, we all have a part to play with them you know, advancing diversity for our learners as well. And we all love, you know, to cut the tension. You have a bunch of slides on microbio and, and epidemiology, so you want to have that one slide of like a comic or a cartoon or something. Just know that for those 30 seconds after you put that slide, you have zero listeners. Personally, I'm a very slow reader, especially in the back of the Thing. And if you have one of those comic strips or anything with text, and I'm like slow to comprehend as well, so like I'm the guy with 30 seconds into the next slide, I'm like, ah, I get it, you know? So just know <laughs> that when you're putting this, you're, while you're getting a little bit of like the mental relaxation from your audience, you're, you're losing all of them. So um, find images that are like just one quick little thing and you got them back, it's not too complex. You should also be paying attention to the image quality. You want like high res images. Nothing's worse than something looks good on your little computer and then you maximize it to the whole slide and then it's just fuzzy or blurry or has a watermark or something. So you have to be very cognizant about how you use images. Okay, so these are all great ideas, you know, but like how do we actually put together a lecture like for a national conference? conference. So I'm talking about from step A, getting selected to give a presentation next year, to step Z, giving the presentation. So who wants to kind of touch on their mental process as they go through creating their <coughs> lecture? I think, we all do. I think we all do a similar process. Mm -hmm. um, so if you were just learning a new topic, right? So the, the great part is if you do this long enough, you'll develop a niche in a certain topic and you won't have to spend hours upon hours of research for every talk. But until you get there, um, I research the topic. Uh, I look up all of the most relevant literature that I can. I take notes on every single article. Then I go through and I read all the notes and I try and find themes, how things are related. And then from there, I mind map the entire thing, and then that is where my learning objectives are born. They are in the mind mapping process, and I see how things kind of relate to one another. 
then from there, I build my story. How do I want to? How do I want to talk about this? Um, you know, I give a DOAC reversal talk, and the very beginning, we talk about you know this little old lady named Betty Ann, who uh, like I go through her whole life, and then she falls and hits her head, and and she comes in unresponsive. Betty, I made up Betty Ann. Like there is no <laughs> Betty Ann, but but it it's like part of that story. So I build all of that. Then I put it all in order, in how I want to talk about it. Then I actually get the computer out and put the talk together. So the very, very last thing is getting the computer and putting the slides together for the talk. And all in all, it for a new topic, it probably takes me um, any like about 90 hours of work because after you've done all of that, then you have to practice it. You have to rehearse it. You have to, while you're speaking, record your voice. Uh, I just do, I have a Mac and I, it's like quick time that I can do the practice to talk and record my voice and then I play it back. Then I hear the ums, uh, maybe I try to deliver a joke and when I'm listening back and the joke sounds terrible, I'm like, no, 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 I can't do that. And that is the whole process. So yeah, I would, I would kind of break it up, at least for me, in, into thirds. You have your, one third of your time preparing for the talk is all like, ideas. I, for months, I'm thinking of like the story, the funny joke I start off with because I always have to have a funny joke, and kind of like the overall message. And then the next third is actually writing down, finding the content, you know, ordering it out, putting the slides together. But then another important third that a lot of people miss, you know, they don't actually prepare to give the talk. You know, you'd be writing the talk and finishing the PowerPoint the night before and then expecting Oh, so the lecture's done, I could just give it. And no, a lot of us speakers are spending as much time preparing and practicing the talk as we are actually writing the talk. And I, I, quick time, the new PowerPoint actually has a, a, a feature, I forgot what it's called, but you like give it and it tells you you gave 15 ums and you paused this many times and it has all these analytics to it. It's like the coolest thing ever, so. I completely agree, um, and not only practicing performing your talk, because right, this is, it's a performance. Um, and so you want to practice actually in the same setting. So if it's on Zoom, which we have all uh, painfully experienced in the last two years, you know that your energy has to be a minimum 50% more. And that's challenging to do if you're sitting down. Most of us feel more natural and more powerful when we're up and standing. And so whether it's getting a standing desk um, that you can actually stand, I know some people will do that for their online presentations, knowing if you're gonna be at a podium, if you're gonna be sitting at a table, you know, how you can incorporate your typical hand gestures, how do you speak, how do you hold your, hold your head. Um, and so all of these little things that, that seem minute, but taking the time to, to work through them really make a big difference um, and really can hammer home your presentation. So I want to take a moment to just reiterate how cool the new PowerPoint feature is with no <laughs> stock or investment in it, but honestly, it is a game changer. It has all this analytics in there. So it does things like catching um, but there's apps that do that already. It actually tracks your speaking cadence and your variability. It will tell when you, get, when you drop and raise your voice too high. It will pick up, um, it actually picks up when you have insensitive words. So it actually picks up you know, diversity issues there, which is super cool. It is really incredible. But what it does, it checks your timing throughout the whole talk, and you can actually see how your cadence and your speaking speed is. And as someone, for those of you who know me, who speaks at about twice the speed in, in general, um, that was really important for me, to figure out how to talk slower and when I can speed up and to make sure I'm not monotone. Um, it's free. So highly encourage if you haven't used that as at least one of your practice rounds, total game changer. Yeah, and I'll just echo my colleagues. I think definitely, the last thing is definitely, you know, practicing in front of trusted friends and colleagues, I think, is, is a great way to test how you're doing. But if you're able to and brave enough to record yourself, it actually will teach you a lot about yourself, how you speak. When I go to actually conferences like this, I listen, I go for two reasons. One, for the content, I promise. But mainly, actually, to look at the speaker and see how are they standing, how are they speaking, how are they engaging the audience. So it gives me a kind of a tutorial, if you will, of the best practices of teaching on ways the audience actually, you know, engages and interacts. So use this time, you know, the next couple of days, listen to the content. That's 
important, but also listen to the speaker and how they're actually getting the audience to engage. And that can really help you to inform for your own personality and your own style, what do you want to incorporate as a speaker? And you can really kind of grow, grow yourself as a, as a national speaker. And the one thing I did want to highlight is, you know, there are a lot of you in here, and not all of you aspire to be national speakers. Not all of you want to get up on stage and, and give these talks. But understand, we're all educators. Mm -hmm. We're all involved in residency education. We all have conference commitments and didactics that we have to give. And this is just one way that you can take all of this to what you're delivering at home mm -hmm. to make your didactics more engaging, to pull your residents in, to really increase that long-term learning that is happening with all of them. So just wanted to put that reference out there because I know not everybody's like, you know, dying to throw on a suit and grab a mic and like, you know, go big or go home. This is all relevant at your local institutions as well. And even in your clinical shifts, I usually grab the residents just for two minutes of teaching is what I call it, just two minutes of, of their time. And so if you're able to figure out how to quickly engage them, toss in a few teaching pearls and then a few take home points, they are very thankful for that. So it's a, a way you can do it even in your clinical shifts. All right, I'm gonna pause here for a second. We got some other little interesting questions I have here, but I kinda wanna see what questions you guys have. So uh, please come up, raise your hand. If you don't wanna come up, I'll bring the mic to you. <laughs> <laughs> Another little pearl for you guys. No one wants to be the first to speak, so just sitting there with the awkward silence. You'll get some people coming up. Yeah, uh, Hello, sir. Yeah, Barney Eskin from Morristown. Um, I was at the previous lecture, and I fell asleep in the previous lecture, and you kept my attention here very well. And it seems like you're, it seems like you're talking to me and telling me things that I need to know, and I'm just wondering whether you can reflect on the fact that the presentation here was so effective as a presentation and it was more effective than the previous presentation that I went to, uh, much more effective. Uh, congratulations. Okay, so congratulations on that. <laughs> I'm just gonna repeat some of the questions. Um, <laughs> and playing okay, into no. the first thing that we talked about with AK and that the building of the story, when you're preparing to write your lecture, you have the things that you wanna talk about, you have the things that the department wants you to talk about, and you have the things that the learners wanna learn about. And so when you're creating your story and thinking ahead, how do you use those three different you know, target audience to kind of create something that is meaningful to everyone? Um, absolutely, so you know, it is all, I always start with what, what do the learners need, right? It is maybe a targeted needs assessment and thinking about like Kern's um, code of design. But if you start there and you find a way to, as AK was saying, really build the narrative. Um, and I think that's what we did here today is earlier this afternoon, we actually got to get together in person and talk and share what our own experience are at national conferences, at our home institutions, at our resident didactics of what we see people doing that you can tell on Zoom that eyes drift and the, their head goes down. Um, and I think every time that you really keep that learner at the center, um, with giving credit to certainly your supporting organization, that's what's gonna make sure that they pay attention to you because you know that you're giving them something that they want and that they need. And I think also just the way it's communicated, if you're talking to a friend or a colleague or it's a conversation instead of just a, you're behind a wall talking, it makes it much more engaging to the audience, like making eye contact, I swear I'm not staring you down, but trying to, I like the smiles and I'll look back at that area, but it, it really helps with the energy and the excitement and it really helps, you know, if you're passionate about that topic, that it really does translate to the audience, right? I mean, our goal is to make all of you guys very comfortable in speaking, that you'll be up here on this panel doing this discussion instead of us and we get to learn from you. Uh, and so, you know, just being passionate about what you're doing, I think really does translate so that even without slides, you see, we talked a lot about slides, but there's only one slide up there that we've used this whole time. It's just, you know, relating to your audience and knowing that, making sure they know they're important and that's why we're up here. All right, so another awkward silence. I'm gonna give you guys an opportunity. Hello. Hi. 
Um, could you guys talk a little bit about um, teaching this skill to others, as in like both faculty development and teaching your colleagues or help assisting your colleagues, but also your residents? I think we talk a lot about kind of developing our faculty, but then our residents become faculty and then that's the time that they learn it. Mm -hmm. Is there a way for us to, as a program, for example, do this kind of education? So that's an excellent question. So let me just do a quick poll of the audience. Who here has some sort of mechanism in place so that either residents or faculty can get their slides reviewed either before the lecture or get specific feedback about their lectures after? Raise your hand. So we're talking about half maybe? Mm -hmm. Okay, so tell us about some mechanisms you guys have seen so that we can give this formal training. So I personally coach uh, anybody in my department that is going to give any kind of talk. And uh, basically everything that we talked about right now, I, I do with them. I give them uh, the books, Presentation Zen and um, Nancy Duarte's Slideology um, and uh, go through all of that with them. I will tell you, you can put on these like pan faculty development or pan resident sessions, but the first step is for someone to actually care about what they're doing. So I have found that the kind of departmental faculty development usually is unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of put it out there and I float it out there, whoever's interested, I'm happy to coach you and that's what we do. And I, and I tell them the goal is for people to learn and for you to get invited back. The, those are kind of the key things that we really want to do, and those are the things we focus on. I don't know if you guys do like a departmental and a faculty. So you can, we can provide all the resources that we want, but it, ultimately it's a personal slide deck, right? It's your slide deck, and however much you send resources, it's not the same as exactly as AK was saying, is that it's coaching, mm -hmm. right? It's going through them in the slides, and it's not just the, and I, I've definitely kind of been on both sides, of, of, well, I've seen this for sure, and I've experienced this as a resident of the, yeah, no, that slide deck looks good, thumbs up. And you feel good inside. You're like, oh, great, my slide deck was perfect. And then you go up there, you're like, my slide deck was awful. But we didn't know, because like, we were so like, oh, that's fine, it's acceptable, right? But that's not the goal of coaching. The coaching is not to make acceptable slides. A lot of lectures can be acceptable, but if you want to become excellent, we have to coach, and it's often serial, you know, back and forth. Um, I coach our residents on, our, on their five-minute uh, journal clubs. And so, like, you know, I'll nudge the residents, you know, about two weeks in advance, one week in advance, and I'm like, okay, hey, let me, say, let me look at your slides, and we'll do back and forth. And sometimes it'll be like three or four rounds, uh, and it'll take me hours. Like, it'll be a whole chunk of my, sometimes a whole day is devoted to their slide decks. Um, but that's how you make better slides. It's coaching at a one-on-one -on -one level, not at a, if I just said, hey, read Presentation Zen, they'd be like, cool, I'll read that next year, and then never read it again, because they're busy, and it's not about them then, it's just here's a resource. So I highly encourage coaching and just like working one-on-one -on -one with someone and then they can teach the next person. Like that's what we do with our fellows. We teach our fellows so they can teach the next, year, next year's fellows. So to give you like an actual framework that you could actually take home, at uh, Kings County where I trained, they had, their conference was built around tracks. It'd be the M&M track, the critical care track, the bounce back track, the senior lecture track, the basic, I forgot what it was called, but the basic foundational track, whatever. And you would have a faculty member and a senior resident assigned to curate the content for each track. It was a prestige thing as a resident that you apply to be a track leader and you get a title and like, you know, some notoriety goes on your CV. And we would get the faculty to also curate. They would be the ones emailing the people assigned to give a lecture in that track, asking for their topic ideas earlier, garnering learning objectives that are specific, then asking for the slide deck at minimum a week in advance, and then giving feedback after. It's a lot, but you need to make a decision as an institution that you value that and it's important, and it needs to be a top-down approach. You need your chair and faculty leadership to say, this is important, we're going to build it somehow into a requirement, you know, to, if you're a faculty in a teaching institution, you have to do some sort of teaching involvement, whether it be as a track chair or 
some other position. It could be incentivized. We have uh, at UMass an incentive comp that you can get for teaching and stuff. So there's ways you can incentivize people, but it has to start off at the top. You have to say that this is important, and then you can build a structure around it. Or you could just have a, a couple great educators who are just going to be like, I'm here if you need it, how, however you want to do that. I think another um, way to approach it is think about it, particularly for our residents, is think about what type of teaching on teaching they need at what level. So for our program, we have our residents that get paired with faculty mentors, so their initial presentations are like M&M or trauma reviews, where they have a faculty member that sponsors the presentation, reviews everything. But we also have year-directed curriculum in our conference schedule that focuses for our second years that are now starting to work with medical students of teaching at the bedside. We have some for our third years that are how to do a chalk talk, right? how to teach larger zones. Um, and so we try to address it at what skill we think they'll need um, before they get to their senior grand rounds, fourth year presentations, uh, but they have built up kind of a series of skills. And definitely kind of in the world of Zoom that we're all still trapped in as well. There's, there's a lot of great, you know, if you look on websites and just type in like Zoom speaker tips, there are so many blogs out there. Harvard Business Review has, you know, their top six tips as well as their top, you know, 10 mistakes that are made. So you can quickly find and curate those resources. Uh, and if you're interested, just find me afterwards. I have a handout on it, on Zoom fatigue that uh, Mike and I worked on, but uh, that can help your speaker already set them up for success and say, these are our expectations. We want it engaging. We want you know, the audience to leave with two or three pearls, right? So if you can set up your speaker for success on what you as the institution want that conference to look like and then send them resources on how to, how to do that, then really your didactics will change a lot. All right, next question. So we, we hear uh, and know now good slide decks have very few words on them, right? My question for you is what so your strategy as far as like shadow documents or other um, things that you keep for your own records for when you're gonna give that lecture again in a year or two or if you're gonna end up passing that lecture topic on to a colleague, um, what, are, what are your strategies for that? So, yeah, my slides alone mean nothing to anyone, even me a year later. So <laughs> I write all the content in my slide notes. Mm -hmm. I used to be so regimented about this that I'd, I'd um, script like exactly, hello, my name is Guy Carmelli and I'm coming from UMass, in case I forget in the moment that I'm Guy Carmelli. And I can, but like, that's how regimented I was. Now it's a little more like chill about it. But there, that's one option. Another thing that was mentioned earlier is I think recordings are invaluable because even if I write something and I, I wrote something about a joke, I, I'm like, I remember I said it in a, in a way that everyone laughed and like, I'm reading it now and it's not like hitting the same, you know? So if you have that video, you're like, oh, you remember. So I record a lot of my lectures either when I'm giving it or practicing for it so that I can rewatch it. But between the notes and that, mm -hmm. anyone else have any thoughts? I'd say the presenter notes section is definitely, um, and I was at the same point as Guy of scripting out my name. Um, you know, but now whenever I'm building a, a slide deck or, or a presentation, going back to what we initially talked about of, of sort of concept mapping, I actually sketch out ideas like on just a piece of copy paper. And then it's those ideas and concepts that I'm actually putting in my notes section now of, of what am I trying to get across rather than that script so that you come across a little less uh, robotic of just reading a script like on a teleprompter line by line um, and then it becomes more conversational and it leads into that really narrative piece that's so important for oral presentations. I'm going to share my secret with you which I'm totally going to regret because uh, now you're all going to know to do this. Um, I write the main points in the notes. I then copy those and put them in a Word document. All of the studies that were on that slide, I inline reference them and I create a handout. I then try and submit the handout as a blog post uh, so that I can kind of get yeah. 
double scholarship out of this one effort. And if I see that you did that and you got in my way to do what I normally do, I'm gonna come at you. <laughs> I'm so sorry, AK. Two years ago, we gave a talk together and she was hounding me after it. Let's turn this into a paper. Let's turn this into, uh, I'll get to it, I promise. <laughs> we have all the, the makings of a good paper. But She's you, really great about that's that. That's just it. If you're you're putting so, like I said, it's like 90 hours, right, mm -hmm. to research this topic and put all of this stuff together. So let's say you're giving a talk at your program. You've done all of this work. You found all this up-to-date information. You included the core things that are on the boards that you know the residents are dying for. But then you included other up-to-date, maybe more controversial things that your faculty want to know about. Just put it in a handout. You have all your references there. If you have, I have EndNote. So I just do inline references with EndNote. That's it. You have the beginning of either a narrative review on a topic that you could submit to a journal. You have a really great blog post uh, that you can submit to any one of these EM blogs that are out there. And they're always looking for content. Um, so that's kind of how I take that information from the talk and, and um, that way I can just hand everything over to someone else if I can't do it. I personally hate speaker notes. I love them and hate them. It's like a love-hate relationship because they're there and they're so tempting, right? As soon as I put things in there, I have to look at them. Um, so what I will do is I'll have two versions of my talk. One is it'll have the main concept of what I'm going to say. Um, I am also recovering, put my name in there and full things as if I'll forget it, but I'll have like the key things in there because that's what I'm going to come back to. It doesn't have to be perfect. My recall of this a year later, you'll recall the key things. You'll recall the key elements you want to share. If it's not said exactly the same, who cares? It's probably better. You've iterated. You've thought it through. It's going to be a better talk because of that. It'll be a different talk because of that. Just the key concepts in there, but the more that we put in there, the more scripted we are in there, the more tempting it is to read off of it. And the more likely that it's going to become one of those talks where the person's reading like this the whole time and you don't feel engaged. And speaking to the earlier comment earlier, like we've all been in lectures where someone's talking like this the whole time and it feels like you're just being monotonely talked at and it's extremely boring. And you doze off in like 10 seconds. And I think it's too tempting when you have speaker notes. So if you are going to do speaker notes, I recommend minimal or none so you don't have the temptation. If you rehearse enough, you'll not need them. And the only other thing I'll bring up is for example, on the app itself, when you look up the PowerPoints, right, the, you don't get the speaker notes, right? So just be thoughtful when you're presenting. A lot of the, a lot of the slides will be either put in as a PDF or just the pictures. So if you are using mainly pictures as your main modality for the slides itself, make sure your handout is robust because otherwise you will not be disseminating that great content that you spent 90 plus hours in curating. And so that's really where your handout could be really valuable. So just copy your speaker notes over into the handout. Don't make it 20 pages because no one's gonna read it, but just kind of cut and you know, be kind of ruthless in your cutting and put, put just the main points there, but really be thoughtful that the speaker notes may not be available unless you send it out as a like email. Yeah, Mike, I, I fell prey to this problem during the Zoom era that we just got out of, I guess. But I'd be so tempted, you know, for the first time ever, you have the speaker notes in front of you. Because every other lecture, I, I, I didn't necessarily have it in front of me. And so I fell prey to just the, the reading and stuff. And now I realize if I want to better my game and I'm forced to do a Zoom, like, get rid of those speaker notes. And they were even telling me earlier, because I think some of my best skills is like how I project and come off, and I can't do that sitting. They're like, just stand in your office. So maybe next time I'll be on the computer, like, <laughs> but you've got to do whatever like, gives you that enthusiasm and strength. All right, what else can I answer for you guys? This is more of like a fun question, I hope. Um, thinking back of all the lectures and stuff that you've done over the years, like what is your favorite type of lecture to give and why? One thing that comes to mind, and then I'll, I'll shoot it to Kelly, because we kind of talked about it earlier, is I now have gotten really into the short lectures. I think that thinking of an hour long lecture is like so daunting and overwhelming and and I realize I can't even speak for an hour. Like I have to down this just to moderate. And so the, the little short 20, 15 minute lectures where you just pick like two little things that you like are my favorite. What do you think, Kelly? 
Yeah, completely agree. I think it's also a fun challenge, right, is to really distill down of what are the absolute like three things that you have got to get out to your learners. And I think one of my favorite talks that I ever gave um, was that I had to truncate it down into 15 minutes. And then I played a game that my history, American history teacher had us do in high school, uh, which is called Factor Crap. Uh, and so the audience had panels. And so it was kind of a great like knowledge assessment as we went through kind of the top five mm -hmm. myths of you know, human sex trafficking. And it was probably one of my absolute favorite lectures to give. Um, and we are actually transitioning at Stanford, asking our faculty, we are moving to 30 minute lectures uh, for Zoom for this next year. So talk to me in a year and I'll let you know how it goes. I think for me, I really like trying to figure out a way to get the audience engaged. Because in my mind, it, I don't want to speak for 50 minutes. That's not where my strength is, and that's also not where my uh, attention span is as well, too. But really, how can I teach a skill or have the audience actually walk away practicing what I'm trying to teach them so they feel empowered to then share it with others as well? So a lot of workshops are in the middle of it. I'll have different breaks that they actually get to practice something. If it's on Zoom, use the chat bar. Like, Chatterfall is a great idea. You have them, like, type a word, like, what is your favorite color? Wait till I count down from three, and three, two, one, and then press enter, and you get a, a cascade of words, like a waterfall, right? So it's really fun. I do always have a heart-stopping moment that no one's gonna put a word in, <laughs> and I was like, this will be a drip coming down instead. But inevitably, everyone types their answers in, and so I like to use that at the end of my lectures. What's one take-home point, or one call to action that you're gonna do based on what I taught? And it also helps me kind of do my own assessment of did I teach that content okay? So that's a, a great way to do it through Zoom. So I, I think that is a great question that kind of led into something else I had written down about like what are fun, creative ways you can give content. I'll, I'll name some that come to mind and then if you guys have any additional stuff. Oh no, now you don't know who we are. <laughs> but uh, you have the basic stuff, the poll everywhere is the cahoots, sure. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of other kind of things where it's like a dueling lecture where you have two speakers assigned a different position on a controversial topic. I've had, we have some people from UMass, uh, Cassie, I'm looking at you, created like escape the rooms where you can do this o online and make it like interactive. I've had a lot of kind of video augmentation and involvement with the, the audience. What other kind of interesting lectures have you guys done? I mean, I think, I think we've all done kind of a, a variety of different formats. It's just picking whatever you're comfortable with because whatever you're comfortable with, you'll probably deliver the most. But I know we're running out of time and I saw a couple people kind of make moves to the mic. Do you wanna get up and ask your question? Sure, I made the mistake of sitting in the back. <laughs> um, but I was wondering if you had any specific tips for how to keep it interesting if you're asked to give a topic, uh, a talk on a topic that you find boring. I think finding, it's helpful if you don't find it interesting because then now you have to be creative and think about it in a different lens. So what is a new perspective or lens? This is really where crowdsourcing, so getting together with your friends and colleagues and be like, this topic is really terrible. And I got tasked with this one topic. So how do I make it interesting? So then you can, you can use what you learned here and how people are presenting ideas. So activities are really helpful to, to make it more engaging. But also just thinking, is there a new spin or perspective on that topic that would make it more interesting, and also the buy-in portion. Like why should, if you don't care about it, why should the audience care about it? So if you could answer that question first, and you could even ask the person who asked you to talk about it, why is this important? Why do I need to talk about this? That can help you to figure out the buy-in and then make it more interesting. A tip I will tell you is, um, what questions do you have about the topic? Right, so let's say it's some like rheumatology thing. I am sorry if anyone in here loves rheumatology and I offended you. But let's say it's something about room. And you're like, oh, well, what, I wonder how I would address a patient that presents with this. So you could just start with a question. Just start the whole presentation with a question. And then give the case and say, what would you do? And now you have hooked people. You've hooked them. They're interested. You had a question about it. They're going to have that same question if you had it. Now they're gonna pay attention. So you took this topic that's really not amazing and exciting in general,
but you've made it interesting now because you've given people a reason to want to pay attention and listen to you. And so I, also, my I was going to say, I also do a lot of board review. As soon as you tie it to the board, students always want to listen. So if you say, you'll see this on your shelf, you'll see this on step one or two, they're like, Sri's the most amazing teacher. It's just like, I'm just trying to get your buying, actually. So that's another way to kind of get the students involved. I'll just say that I would keep an open mind. If you talk to a lot of the educators, you'll, and you're thinking to yourself, how do I develop a niche for myself? A lot of these educators will tell a story. I'm, I'm recalling, you know, I was in a lecture with Amal Matu, and he had no interest in cardiology until he was assigned a cardiology lecture in a board in residency, and then now he's the cardiology guy. But so many of us were like told to do something that we thought was ne not necessarily interesting, but then you put a lot of effort and you research it and you become like the most knowledgeable person in your residency at that time on that topic and then you don't know when you'll be, you know, that person, you know, who gives these kind of talks. So keeping an open mind will be important. Yeah, taking on the boring topic is the best way of actually probably getting that spot for ASAP because everyone's fighting over PE and heart failure and no one's like, I'd like to cover obscure room, please, and onychomycosis, and uh, like no one wants those topics. Those are free reign. There's no, no competition. That could be your niche. You have to just be moderately interesting in that one and it's succeeding <laughs> zero. So find the one that's like the less interesting. You actually probably have the first stab at that one and the second and third in all of them. Okay, a couple more questions. I think there might be a time back. Time, yeah. uh, one final question. Oh, yeah. One yeah. final question. So this is all really helpful for like individual lectures. Thank you for that. Um, but then taking a step back and thinking about like resident didactics are five hours long. Mm -hmm. And even if you have really interesting lecturers and they've all heard these tips and tricks, like sitting through five hours of back-to-back -back lectures, mm -hmm. and a lot of ours are still one-hour formats, can yeah. be difficult. How do you think about like the larger like specific like lecture for this day and five hours of lectures like designing that structure and arranging different modalities or you know lengths of lectures? What's the best way to approach that and create like a good didactic session? So yeah, we have we're tasked with creating five hours of content once a week as a residency requirement. How are we making it so it's not just five one hour boring ass like discussions? <laughs> Um, so I, having just gone through this of curating what that year looks like, um, and it really is, it's such a fascinating puzzle yeah. uh, if, if you're in that role to, to play, and looking at the different styles of lectures that you have, right? So we have QI, we have m and that's a very different feel. It, it requires discussion and thought and thinking about systems level issues. We have foundational topics for the core content, core clinical content. We have our simulation days where they get to be up and moving and actively applying or, or doing procedures. And so all of that to fit together a day where essentially there's, there's a different flavor um, as you go through those four hours to keep the residents engaged. So most of our foundational cases, we, we work them through as cases, almost like oral board cases, right, which demands just a different way of thinking and engagement than when you get to kind of sit back and, and listen to maybe a fourth year grand rounds talk. Um, so that's sort of my approach, is looking at the overall um, flexibility of how to incorporate the different styles of learning that they'll experience. Okay. Uh, I'll add maybe one more piece on there. Um, so that's really good from the lens of when you're planning it. Um, oftentimes I'm assigned the lecture, so I have zero control over it. They're like, here's, here's your hour. Um, remember that that hour is now officially yours. As soon as they say, here's your hour, you can do whatever you want with it. You can make it two 30-minute lectures. You can make three 20-minute lectures. You can design it however you want. So just because it's an hour doesn't mean it has to be an hour. Flex, you know, find some way to break it up. Even things like panels. The reason panels hold attention, at least part of it, is that you're hearing each of us break up your attention by speaking intermingled throughout the whole time. So we keep causing you to re-engage. That's, that's part of the reason panels work, right? Um, if you're going to do a lecture, find something to force people to re-engage more frequently. The poorly written literature says about five to seven minutes. It's probably shorter. But find ways to frequently re-engage or else people will zone out.
And then lastly, have someone be in charge of time. Tell your lecturer they actually only have 10 minutes to whatever time you gave them or seven minutes to the hour, because you do need to stop on time, because inevitably they will go to the exact hour, and then you have the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And so if you're able to build in either feedback time at the end of it where they have to do the evaluation that's already built into that session, you'll get a much better feedback rate. But then also you give them a mental break, like a mental pause. So that's something I would definitely encourage is tell your lecturer if you give them a one hour block, you only have 45 minutes. Yeah. Right. Five minutes for questions. Make a, lot, out. Yeah. a lot less contact. Because in the history of lectures, no one has ever been upset that you ended early. Yes. But everyone's upset when you end late. Yeah. And so I, I haven't asked them, but I feel comfortable that I can volunteer uh, on their behalf. Our emails are listed in the yeah. handout. If you guys need coaches, you don't feel like you have them locally, for sure you can email me at any time and I think that they would all agree that you can email them. I've every year after a lecture like this gotten some residents, some faculty, I'm about to give a speaking, can you look at my slides? Completely happy to do that so feel free or come see us after. But yeah, it was a pleasure getting to speak to you all.